both of you. My name is Aaron. I am the managing editor at Willamette Week. You've met Sophie and Joanna. Uh, we are here today to talk about uh, Senate District and here I'm going to see if I can remember the 14. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Senate it. District 14. Um, so we have two candidates here today. Uh, as I believe, Senator, you know we don't necessarily get equal time, which means that like we may ask one of you a question and then follow up with three or four follow-up questions and get into a conversation, and then the other person's wondering why is there all the attention being paid to one person. That's simply because this is a free-flowing conversation with the intent to get to the bottom of some policies and uh, learn a little bit about the workings of the legislature. Uh, you are welcome to chop talk to each other, you need to respond to each other. Uh, a lot of candidates prefer to actually say to us, like, I'd like to respond to that, and that's perfectly appropriate. Uh, we do ask that you not interrupt to interrupt each other when uh, debating, if you end up debating on an issue of some kind today. Of course. Um, without further ado, um, Let's begin by asking the incumbent sure. senator to give us a two-minute biography and why you are seeking uh, why you are seeking re-election. Sure, thank you. Um, well, I am happy to be here, and um, thanks for having me. So uh, I have coined myself this before, and it is still is true that I'm a little bit of an accidental politician. I started out my career in Oregon as a, a prosecutor with Multnomah County. I moved, um, during that time I also taught at Portland Community College and um, when I left the district attorney's office I went to the Psychiatric Security Review Board, um, was appointed to that board for eight years and then after I rolled off that board I um, chaired the nonprofit um, board here, uh, um, transition projects in Portland. Um, I when it, it's very funny because of course it feels very similar when in 2020 what my main concern was was uh, making sure that we didn't have a Trump president and making sure if we did have a Trump president that the state legislature was as strong as it could be and so I um, got a call from then Governor Kate Brown who I'd known for years because she was a child's attorney and I was a district attorney and we had some cases together and um, she said, you should run for this, to which I was like, who is this? Get off my phone. What are you talking about? Like, that seems like a crazy idea to run for this. But the more I thought about it, um, I had teenagers at home, and we kind of shove our kids out into the world and say, go ahead and take a chance and make the world better. And here, here I was kind of presented with that. So um, I, I decided to throw my hat in the ring, and um, I am glad I did. Um, I think that uh, the... Um, I think that, that I've sort of proven myself to be a proven leader, and um, I'm going to continue <coughs> to do that work for, for Oregonians going forward. Great, thank you. Uh, could you do the same? Introduce yourself and tell us why you're running. Yes, um, I am, um, I don't know if I would call myself an accidental politician, because I've always been interested in politics. Let me pause you just one second, and I'm sorry to pause you, but could you introduce yourself to the viewers yes. at home? I don't think they know your yeah. name yet. My name is Katie Brumbelow. Um, and I grew up in this area, um, and I have lived um, most of my life in Washington County. Um, I have four children, um, and I have a, I have a stepson um, and four daughters at home. Um, I started becoming more involved locally while I was living in southwest Portland um, in Multnomah Village, and my kids were young. And we started becoming involved in like making sure we had a neighborhood park. So we lived down the street from Spring Garden Park and um, helped kind of get that park project going. Um, and then um, most of my time has been spent raising my kids. I just recently started working again at my daughter's school. Um, they go to a small private Christian school in Beaverton. Um, I threw my hat in the ring because I feel that um, having lived here many years, um, there are many people that are not involved in the political process at all anymore because they feel disenfranchised for one reason or another. Um, and I'm a minor party candidate, so I think libertarians make up 1% of Oregonians. <laughs> 
Um, but, you know, non-affiliated voters make up a large percentage of Oregonian voters, and um, I think that they have consistently been dropping out of that process because they're not heard from as much by a sort of um, skewed to one side leadership. So it'd be fair to say that you're running in part to like elevate the voices of the people who you don't feel are currently being heard. Yes, heard. yes. What voices are, or what do you think those voices are seeking in their representation that they're not currently getting? Well, I think that our communities are struggling to make it financially. Um, and I think that a lot of well-intentioned programs are adding to a financial burden to, for a lot of folks. A lot of small business owners, um, people putting their kids in school, um, just figuring out how to navigate your time and have your kids in school. It, it's a stressful world and I think um, it would be good to take a look at some of those policies that have been really passed through quickly in the legislature and see are they really accomplishing what they were intended to do. Um, I know that we start out with good intentions, but then we need to review those intentions. Uh, any in particular? Uh, yeah, so I I think affordable housing is something that is not really making housing more affordable. Um, it makes it affordable for a certain group, but overall the cost of housing is definitely increasing. <laughs> and I know that there's different measures that are being taken to um, circumvent that, like, um, you know, House Bill 2001 that allowed single family residences to be zoned differently so you can make duplexes. That's a, a, a great intention, but creates a greater burden on cities and counties because now they have to match all of their zoning to the state zoning, and that in, increases permitting costs. So then that burden gets passed into the value of the house and now all of a sudden you have more expensive housing, but a well-intentioned bill to prevent that from happening. Okay. Uh, Senator, I want you to talk a little bit about, if you would please, mm -hmm. the, the last session. You were key in leadership for that session. Yeah. What should Oregonians take away from what the legislature accomplished? What are you most proud of? Usually I, I ask someone here to, we ask someone here to say sure. like, what bill did you pass? And in this case, you sort of passed them all. So like, yeah. we, would, we would like you to take a moment and talk to us a little bit about what it is that you feel that the, the party achieved. Sure. Well, um, the last session was a short session and, um, you know, we really went into that session um, wanting to make sure that we sort of put forward the sort of urgent issues that we think Oregonians need, but also do it in a bipartisan fashion. And that was something that we really strove for coming off of, of the long 23 session that of course had a, a few hiccups in that regard, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so I think we were really focused on two things and you know, and I, and I think the, the housing and then of course, um, the one that I was most intimately involved of course was the, um, uh, the ha uh, House Bill 4002, which was trying to address the drug crisis. So um, we continued, of course, on with making important investments in housing. Um, I think Katie's absolutely right. Like we, we should be looking back at and making sure that those policies that we pass are doing what we intend them to do. But I also say that oftentimes what happens, I think, is um, that we don't give those policies enough time. Like I think that we've, we've, a lot of people in the housing space especially have talk, thought a lot about what are the things that we need to do to increase our housing stock and how do we get there. And so, so I think that letting those policies do their work over, over a longer period of time is gonna be important. I was, of course, as you know, involved in the um, uh, in addressing the drug crisis. Um, it it became sort of a, clear to us that it was becoming an emergent issue when we had four, five to seven people dying of overdoses every single day in Oregon, and that became something that we knew we needed to address, and we needed to address it in a holistic way. Um, and so, I'm I'm proud of a number of things that we did in that. Um, we really listened to what Oregonians wanted and I think what voters really wanted. Uh, we tried to address the root causes of, um, of drug use and, and housing is one of them. The lack of housing is something that is uh, really difficult to get out of addiction if you don't have stable housing. So, so that is part and parcel. 
Uh, we did recriminalize drugs, but we did it with a, an eye towards um, a health approach first. Um, and I think that's what was we were trying to reflect in uh, the deflection uh, piece of the legislation. But we did other really important things in that legislation. We made um, medically assisted treatment in jail something that is going to be more easier to get, right? We know how to treat opioid use disorder and a lot of it has to do with medication so we made that easier to do. Um, we made sure that uh, we were taking care of the open air drug drug dealing that was happening especially important when, but it was happening all over right and that was really in response to a case called Hubble um, that pulled that rolled back um, what we what we called a void delivery and I it's a little bit wonky. I'm happy to go into it if you want. Um, and then we made some really strategic investments. So we invested in, in what I termed shovel-ready projects, meaning uh, projects that were uh, that we could get up and running in the next sort of 18 to 24 months, uh, and that we're going to address sort of the the crisis care continuum that we needed to have in order to make sure people get off of drugs. How closely are you tracking the results on the ground when it comes to House Bill 4002? So um, I sort of co-architect of that was Jason Krupp. He and I have actually traveled around the state and gone and visited sort of a number of different uh, places in order to kind of check in on how things are going with deflection. I can't tell you I've done a, a huge whole sweep of the state, but certainly we've tried to go and check in on a number of different places. Um, and so I, I'm, I, one of the things that we wrote into the bill was that the, um, that the, the Criminal Justice Commission, the CJC, uh, was going to be collecting some best practices and that those best practices are going to be put back forth to the legislature for us to really look at what's working and what's not. And we, you know, I think what was really important in that bill was, um, if, you, if you guys recall, the very first sort of framework we put out there literally everybody hated. So <laughs> I felt like I might be onto the right track because everybody hates this. But that framework had us, you know, saying everybody has to do this deflection. And when, when we got a lot of pushback on that, and we listened to a lot of people, and we talked to not only my Republican colleagues, but also the police, the district attorneys, um, and county officials, they wanted it as a sort of an opt-in. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting about that is that this opt-in period, um, 26 out of 36 counties opted in, I think it was 26. I mean, a huge amount of the counties decided to opt in. And because of that, because we allow this sort of local jurisdictions to come up with what they think their local jurisdictions need, we are going to be able to look back and look at what's working, what's not, and then as we go forward, put some parameters on that. I mean, that's the whole idea of having that report back. So what do you make of the fact that the state's largest county by population does not have a deflection center and may not have one soon? Well, I think they are, they are, they have a form of deflection. They are using, um, they are using peers to meet people on the street. That is happening. I know, um, I know that that's going on. They do have a deflection center that's coming up. We, we didn't, there was nothing. Do you, do you believe them that it will ever open? I do. I do believe them. I don't know if I'd make that commitment if I were you. I, no, I, I believe that they, they will. What we heard really strongly, especially from Portland, was um, they, many of the police were um, really just felt like they couldn't do anything with what was happening on the streets. And many of them said to me, I don't want to, look, I don't want to take people to jail, but I need to, I need to take them somewhere. I couldn't well, possibly tell you, I couldn't I, what possibly is this tweaking that's happening? The, okay. This, they, one of the real joys of this election cycle <laughs> has been that there's a, an ongoing construction Well, place process, noises, yeah. Yeah, okay, I don't know what's happening over there, but they've covered all the cars. Okay. Well, I know, it <laughs> sounds like a squirrel. Um, and one, of, one of the, so, so, you know, what I had asked, and what the legislature has did 
was for Mul with Multnomah County, and, and I was in contact with them, was like, what do you need to open up a deflection center? Like, how much? What is it? And we, as you know, invested a great deal of money to make that happen. And I do believe that the leadership is, um, is, is trying to get uh, something open. They obviously have the building, and, and I've taken a tour of it, um, and it's getting renovated as we speak. Um, and I do believe that their intentions are to open that up. I'm confident that those are their intentions. But did they get the money, that, the exact amount of money that they wanted yeah. from you? Yes, they did. Well, then why isn't it open? Well, we were on a fast timeline. I, I can't speak to why they haven't opened it up. I mean, I don't, I don't know that piece of it. It's a fast timeline. Um, I mean, if I were in your shoes, I but, would take the opportunity to throw them thoroughly under the bus right now. But like, you know, know I, 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 you know, here's what I'd say. I, I think that um, that politicians, they're, they are, they do have their best intentions. I think they are trying to do the right thing. I think it is, it is slightly more complicated uh, in Multnomah County. As the, the state, we have, we've tried to give them everything they asked for in order to get this, this off the ground and, and up and running. And I, I got it, I'm an optimist. I have to continue to believe that, will, that they will be able to do that. And, and if they aren't, then they will continue to hear from me, of which I am in contact quite regularly. Oh, that's an actually that uh, a fair question. How often, how often are you chatting with the County officials about this? Oh, I, I mean, we have, uh, we've had several meetings. I give them calls all the time. Uh, Jessica Vega Peterson and I have met. I have phone calls with other county commissioners as well. Um, I am trying to be helpful and encouraging. While also saying you got to get you got to get this thing off the ground. This is what people in, want. And this is what they've asked for. This is what the police have said that they they need. Okay. I'd love to get a libertarian perspective on on deflection. I, I can't even figure out what the libertarian position would be on deflection. Tell me. Well, um, the libertarian position on this issue that you're talking about, which is a community issue. It's always, first of all, like libertarians clearly are not for putting people in jail for drug related, drug offense, owning drugs, right? So the, the idea is that people are responsible for their own bodies and their own decisions regarding that. Um, with regard to addiction and, and deflection and keeping people out of, out of the system, yet getting them the help that they need. Those solutions are always best when they're community driven, led, when they're voluntary, when they're nonprofit sector focused. Um, you know, Portland is an interesting place and I, <laughs> I've lived here long enough to have seen kind of the, the mental health crisis evolve in, in this city. And we keep adding more money, but not coming up with any real solutions. Um, and part of that, as you mentioned, is related to housing. <laughs> if people can't live somewhere affordably, then they can't have a solution to, to become clean. So, I mean, the lowest common denominator is prison, right? And you can get um, somebody with an addiction help if they're in prison and they can be required to, you can medicate them, right? We had a family living with us a few years ago, and he uh, was in need of mental health care. They lived with us for four months. Um, eventually, he did enter the system and got the, the mental health and um, uh, medication that he needed, but it was a long process. And what we're doing is taking something that is a long process and turning it into a crisis situation that the state now has the responsibility to address. And the state is doing a terrible job of addressing that. And the county is struggling to address that. The city, <laughs> you know, the cops, as you mentioned, like they, yeah, the cops kind of have their hands tied. Um, you know, I have a friend also who responds to mental health crises in Portland and it, it's not working because it is bureaucratic in nature. And what we need are, we need to empower local charitable organizations 
to do what they need to do um, to help with addiction counseling, to, to be able to find a place where they can uh, provide housing, you know, maybe next door, <laughs> more inexpensively. And, mm -hmm. and Portland should be fixing some roads, you know, should be working on things that, that we know how to do and leaving some mental health crises to small communities of support. The police don't often have the bandwidth to deal with mental health crises. They, they work hard, um, but they're also in a position where if they deal with something in the wrong way, um, they will be sued, right? Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, but, heck, but how do you deal with the open air drug dealing? It's, it is a problem in the city. Absolutely. Right? I will tell you. Contest that it has not gotten much better, at least from, from my observations <laughs> walking up and down Burnside. No. You know, when I think it was 2020, um, we went downtown, my family and I went downtown, and uh, we, on one of the hottest days, just decided to pass out water, actually, to folks downtown. And that was kind of my revisiting the city of Portland again. You know, I had. Had taken been comfortable taking my family downtown years ago, but now not so much, right? But mm -hmm. we did this a few years ago. We went downtown and we um, talked to people and gave them water. And you know, I thought, <laughs> um, oh, this is a, this is really difficult. What do we do? Well, all all we do is jump in and show some care and concern. And I think that's not on a politician's bandwidth, honestly. And that's not on the police bandwidth. Like what you have to do is ask the people in the community who have neighbors, how can we deal with the open air drug dealing that is happening right outside your apartment building? And that's dealt with at a community level. Like that should be a neighborhood association conversation. That it should start there, honestly. But in your neighborhood association, you have... I'm sorry, but like you're telling me I should be personally empowered to deal with the problem outside my apartment building? Absolutely. Yes. In you fact, want me to get a squirt gun? What do you want me to do? <laughs> well, if you notice someone dealing drugs outside of your apartment building and you feel uncomfortable there, what's the first thing that, that you're going to do? Me, me personally? Sure. What I've been doing for the last three years, walk away. Okay. And and that's what we as a state have been doing and we've been walking away and saying it is our state legislature's responsibility to solve that problem personally and and when the state legislature I mean, I just think decides, that if you ask me to solve the problem you're not going to like my solution sure sure like, all right <laughs> but if we asked for example you to solve well, you personally may not solve the problem but let's say you know someone who is a mental health crisis responder could you talk to them and come up with a solution? Could you talk? Could this you is talk what I pay taxes for. No, well, yeah, could, right? Is that's what you're paying a lot of taxes for. And that tax burden continues to increase greatly, greatly. Like 50, over 50% 50 of what we pay is for education and healthcare in our tax burden. And that the return on that investment is very poor. You know, we pay 1% on roads. The return on that isn't that great either. But we will continue to pay for things um, when we don't look at the solutions we're offering and see what's being accomplished. Like I noticed your conversation with Senator Lieber was, okay, what? how are you gonna follow through on this? That's always the question here. How are you gonna follow through? You follow through by getting the community motivated and activated to follow through, not, not at the state level. Okay. Well, I would just, yes. Well, I mean, I would just respond that I, I don't think any community member should go out and approach drug dealers and try to deal with them on their own. So I would just sure. put that out for, for everyone to, yes. to make sure that that's uh, not happening. I think that the, um, uh, the, the, the law that we implemented uh, and around the drug dealing where we made it, we, we've made sentencing more um, we've upped sentencing for people drug dealing in parks, and we've upped sentencing for people dealing drugs around um, uh, around shelters and around um, and, and drug dealing around uh, any kind of um, uh, places where people are getting uh, drug counseling. I think is going to be really important. Will it happen overnight? Absolutely not. 
Does it take time to develop those cases in order to make sure that we can prosecute some of these drug dealers? It does. So I would just say there are things that are in the works, and I know that the police are working are working on that, and it's it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and we are, are chasing a tsunami of fentanyl. This isn't we um, in 2020. Uh, the main drug here on the streets of Portland was heroin. Yeah. And in 18 months, less than 18 months, two, two years, it's significantly changed to, to, right, to fentanyl. And so we, along with many, many other um, states, are chasing sort of chasing the tsunami of fentanyl that is, is really creating havoc across the whole country. So, so I would just say that we are in a, a unique time where, where a lot of people are struggling, a lot of police, a lot of, of of um, uh, people in the system, a lot of nonprofits are really struggling with how to how to do this differently. I was in um, when we had our hearings. I was so struck by this. So we <clears throat> we asked some nonprofits to come in, and and this we were talking about the fentanyl crisis, obviously in our committee. And um, one of the people who was testifying said, "We're." We're not planning for long-term fentanyl users. I mean, we, we planned for long-term heroin users. We're just not planning for it. And when the follow-up question was asked, why not? They were just like, they will likely not survive. And so we're dealing with something that is... Um, and do you think that's true? I, I think fentanyl is at 50 to 100 times more potent, right? I think that it is... Um, I think that people don't know what fent what's in this pill. It's oftentimes not pure. And there's new things that are getting cut into it, like some of that horse tranquilizers and stuff that, that are coming. Um, I, I think that we are in a really precarious situation where people are taking their, their own lives, right? They're in, into their hands every time, every time they take a fentanyl pill. And I think it is so extraordinarily addictive that despite knowing that, despite sort of having this would be a little bit of a Russian roulette every time they do it, they're still taking it. And I think that says everything we need to know about how addictive it is. Is there a way to reduce the supply? So, um, yes, but it is complicated. We, we've got HIDA, which is the High Intensity Drug Task Force. That's a federal task force that does operate and, and tries to stem the tide of, of fentanyl coming in. Um, I think that the fentanyl that's coming up from sort of the south, we've got to figure out how to capture it more at the border than we're doing now. Um, I think the big drug busts that are happening, and I think those do take a lot of time to um, to just develop those those uh, cases, are are helpful. We need the federal government's help, quite frankly, in this. Oregon can't do it. I mean, it's just it's it's just um, it's just something that we're going to have to have the federal government working in tandem with us to try to figure out how to stop it. Okay. Uh, so, if you got any questions, like that. Okay. Joanna, okay. I have more then. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Everybody thought for a second we were just going to get out of here. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no, no. You are a former prosecutor with the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. That's a correct statement. Uh, victims advocacy, right? Is that what your area or no? Uh, child, child abuse. I, 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 I did a variety of things in the District Attorney's Office, but the majority of time I spent prosecuting child abuse cases. Now that yeah. he is departing, give him my credit grade. So, boy, that's hard. You know, I, I, it's funny because, of course, Nathan and I worked together in the DA's office for many, many years because he's been in the district attorney's office for a long time. And I'll ask you I, a second, too. I, I think that... Um, I, I don't know if I can give Mike a, 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 a grade, but let me tell you my thoughts on it. I think he came in at a really difficult time. Um, I think that uh, uh, Rod Underhill, who I worked with, prior district attorney, sort of, if you recall, sort of the timing of when Mike entered, uh, it was sort of right around the George Floyd stuff was happening, and we had, um, you know, important issues were being discussed around Black Lives Matter, and, and, and we had... Um, 
a lot of things happening in Portland, like the rioting and stuff that was occurring. And I think Mike took sort of control of that office at a sort of a fraught time. Um, and I think there were some mistakes, missteps that, that he made uh, in that. I think Mike really wanted to change the conversation around criminal justice, and I, I think that's a laudable goal. I think the world uh, changed around him a little bit as he was in office, um, and I think that um, he probably got back to more of law and order towards the end of his years at the district attorney's office. I um, think it was a little bit too little too late by that time. Um, Your thoughts on Nathan? I, like I said, I've known Nathan for a long time. He is. Um, I mean, I know a he's lot of a people very know good. I don't like, so I'm yeah, curious. no, I, I, no, no, no. I, I like Nathan. Um, he is a good prosecutor. He understands what it is to be a line prosecutor. You know, meaning uh, he has he has been doing this work for a long time. I think it's going to be really important in many ways because I think that that office needs some like some support, and I think he's going to be able to understand what it's like to be a line prosecutor and that there's a lot of um, stresses that go along with that. So so I think that, that um, he'll be good about supporting that. And I you know I think that the I think that Portland has sort of changed and that they're they're sort of going back to um, a more law and order stance and I, I think Nathan's gonna be able to bring that back to Portland and I, I think you saw that reflected in in the vote. Okay. Thoughts on the Wilma County prosecutor's office, how's it doing? Um, well, I would say that we do swing back and forth between law and order <laughs> and not so much. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see the, how much things change with Nathan's leadership. Um, I, I think that Portland, um, I mean, just to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, I That's think okay. that the the relationship between the mayor and the police department has always been pretty sticky in Portland and um, it's interesting to see that even though the form of government has changed that item has not changed so um, the mayor is still responsible to to hire the police chief um, in Portland anyway so <laughs> when it comes to prosecuting offenses it's interesting because like the government <sighs> A government is helping with one hand and prosecuting with the other hand. Like ultimately the government's responsibility is to maintain law and order, right? So in Portland, when uh, you have a movement like where individual rights come to the surface and, and freedoms and we have um, the legalization of drugs coinciding with um, Black Lives Matter and all of these things that just bring individual rights to, to the surface and then we have some freedom, right? And the climate changes, you have more personal freedom, but still less responsibility <laughs> from, um, from our court system to deal with those individual, and fear, honestly, like the police are afraid in Multnomah County to, to deal with um, certain situations because their hands are tied. So by whatever the political climate happens to be at that time and that's unfortunate and I think ideally think things will change and police will be more supported. Um, you know, I just comparing Washington County Police Department with um, Multnomah, there's a difference in the way um, the, the manager style of government empowers the police to do their job. Um, and I, I don't think there should be an adversarial relationship between um, the attorney's office and and the police department. It's unfortunate. It's caused a lot of havoc in Multnomah County. Thank you. I'm going to give the opportunity to each of you to ask your opponent a question if you like. Sure. All right. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. You go first. Okay. Um, my questions, we haven't talked very much about um, health care, like funding health care, um, and I had hoped to ask you too just about um, your, in your experience in the legislature, mm -hmm. what do you believe constitutes an emergency when you pass a bill declaring an emergency, for example, okay. with regard to health care? That has happened. Um, we had an emergency declaration for COVID, obviously. Yeah. But also, there's there's the habit of passing 
um, legislation declaring emergency um, just to get it through quickly, right? So that it is, so you can, you can. You're talking um, about the emergency clause that yes. put on the end of legislation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so when you are using that clause um, and you're using it with regard to health care, how do you determine whether this is something we need funds for right away with regard to health care, so we're going to declare an emergency, mm -hmm. or this is something that we should maybe run past th through the system and get some feedback on. Um, does that question make sense to you? Yeah, I sort of, because of course, y even without, even whether you have an emergency clause or not, it's going to go into effect if you've, if you've voted on it. So, right. it's so just 90 days versus... Versus yeah. sort of an, an immediate... Right. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, I think the use of an emergency clause, it sort of really depends on, on the legislation and, and some negotiation um, involved. Uh, most of the time we leave the emergency clause on there, so it does, it is enacted within 90 days. Um, so I'd say that's, but I don't have a, I don't, I don't think there's like a, we do it in this situation, we do it in that situation. Does that make sense? Like, I don't think there's some, some bright line that I can I can tell you about it. It really it really does depend. Now, if you're talking on money, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Always. most of healthcare, you know, most of healthcare is uh, supported by federal dollars. So mm -hmm. most of the healthcare that we put out from the general fund is usually supported by by federal dollars. Where you're getting Medicaid or or, or something uh, back on on that, and that is oftentimes like dependent on Medicaid and what they'll pay for. Right. And so, so um, I I don't I don't know about the emergency clause piece of, of that. I mean, I don't, it it really depends. Like, do you have a specific? Thing I do. In I'm, mind? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because it seems to me that um, more and more our our legislature does enact bills pretty quickly <laughs> and and passes things through very quickly and and particularly since um, you know we have the the change and the increase in funding from the federal government for the Oregon Health okay. Authority right so we have okay. funding available for health care from the federal government okay that's what you just indicated right well Medicaid yeah right yeah okay and then how for so I have a I know of a person who is waiting for an elective surgery. Okay. And he is on um, a federal plan, so he's a veteran. Okay. And then his veteran plan uh, has now dropped him and put him into Oregon Health Plan. Okay. And so he has waited approximately 18 months to get hip replacement surgery. Um, however, when when do we start looking at oh this is a problem people who need, <laughs> who need surgeries are not being allocated funds and they're having to jump through a number of hoops at the federal level and the state level um, to, to get the, the care that they need. Okay. When would, when would you lot to unpack in this. Okay, hold on. <laughs> so, well, first of all, I don't know why he would be dropped down. I don't understand that. Usually, if he's a veteran, he should probably stay on the the VA's um, health health care and then you would get it at the uh, he would get his health care at the VA so we've also had a um, problem in Oregon with our anesthesiologists which have that backed up which has really backed up um, surgeries as you you know as you may know uh, and um, that the adequacy of the medical care system is something that I have been talking about like and it's a workforce issue right but there's nobody that has Nobody that oversees and says our our healthcare system workforce wise is adequate, right? There's nobody saying you've got enough of this, enough of that, enough of that. Mm -hmm. That that a little bit is an aside, but but that I think that's really important when you talk about healthcare because we are losing doctors, nurses at an alarming rate, and we're not replacing them fast enough. Right. And so that's that's going to be something that we you know take into the future. So, but we have to we have to keep our eye on that, or we're going to be in real trouble as the silver you know, the way it happens with um, the boomers getting older. So, so I, I can't speak to the specific, but if you're talking about pre-authorization, mm -hmm. that's actually something um, that I've been very interested in um, looking at. So I'm a, a survivor of breast cancer, 
um, had breast cancer more than 15 years ago, just recently had to have a, diff a surgery. I got denied by my insurance company as well to have a surgery that I eventually got, but mm -hmm. it took a while to, to jump through a few hoops. And I think we really do have to look at our pre the pre-authorization piece and how controlled it is by insurance companies. Um, if they're all trying to keep the cost of health care down. But they can't keep the cost of health care down by denying coverage. Right. It's it's their it's counterintuitive. So, um, but it, but if that's if that was the genesis of your question, I mean, I think that we do we should be looking at that. And I think that I've had conversations with Andrew Stolfi, who is our insurance right. He's the insurance um, director, and he you know he and I've talked a lot about insurance. It's complicated. This is one, sorry, I think we should yeah. move on. Um, would you like to ask a question? Sure. <laughs> so I did I did see uh, that uh, you have, you are um, pro-life and I'm wondering how do you square that with your libertarian views? What do you mean by, so as a libertarian, yeah. um, I believe in the greatest personal freedom for the individual. Okay. And as a libertarian, I believe that an individual is an individual no matter how small. So in other words, if you have a child, okay. um, that child should be allowed to survive. Does that make sense to you? But you're saying that an embryo is a child? I'm saying that, well of course, because we were all okay. embryos at one point in this room. And here we are. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I loathe <laughs> yeah. where we're about to go with this. <laughs> I do have to ask at what point you consider the embryo to be a child. Is it by viability? Is it like three months, first trimester, second trimester, third? Well, as a libertarian, I would say that it is certainly not the government's responsibility to determine the viability of an embryo. Right, but they're going to be the ones who will prosecute the, the woman for getting the abortion, right? So, like... So, I, like, I've lived here for a long time, and I recognize that people get abortions, you know. Um, and I personally have not chosen that route. But I, and I don't believe that the government's responsibility is to provide access. Okay, so I believe that it's actually the government's responsibility to protect the individual from the group. In this case, as a, as a pro-life person, I believe an individual, like I believe all of my daughters were individuals before I could see them on the outside. I think Aaron's asking like, when do you consider the person to start being an individual? Oh, I, I mean, I guess as soon as the person so as soon as the egg is fertilized. Okay. Yeah. That's the answer. Um, <laughs> okay. So we're moving to what we call the fun question. Ooh. <laughs> Real fast pivot there, I realize, but uh, but we're running low on time and sure. this construction and isn't gonna stop, so. <laughs> it's not, and I'm, I'm looking at all the cars that are yeah. getting covered. They're getting so. ready for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch exactly. of ghosts, really big ghosts. <laughs> Cargo. It's actually a really no week project. The, yeah. fun, the fun question <laughs> this time around is, what were you best known for in high school? Oh, all right. All right, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. I was um, I was a 12-letter athlete. So I I lettered in three different sports all four years. It was cross country, basketball. I'm from Indiana, so you had to play basketball. I think it was a contract. Uh, and I ran track. Oh. Great. All right. Your turn. I was, um, what was I known for in high school? I went to Hillsborough High School and I was in choir. So we had a good choir program. Um, and I was in the international high school. So we, um, I was interested in foreign languages. And um, I think I don't know what my reputation was because it was a huge class. There were sure. 450 of us, <laughs> and I don't really care um, <laughs> what the reputation was. But I would say, like, just um, as a, a person who was concerned about everyone being able to participate in our high school. So we had a number of, um, we had a cultural 
of the Principal's Advisory Committee on Cultural Diversity. And we every year had a fair that invited everyone to share from their culture and their food. And it was the mid-90s and it was like Hillsborough was booming with um, people from all over the world working at our great industries that are there. Um, so yeah, that's what I was known for, just meeting new people. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank your time. You. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.